Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's workshop on supply chain security introduction with Sven Rupert. Um, my name is Julia Batnelli, and I'm a part of JFrog's developer relations team, and we're really excited to have you here today. Um, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items before we got started. Um, first off, as we go through this workshop, you'll be using a free community version of the JFrog platform, which Sven will um, walk you through shortly. And this is not a trial version. It's yours to keep and to keep as long as you want and continue working with and using um, what you learned from today's workshop. Um, second, we have chat support. So Yuvarajan and Kushal are two of our support engineers and they are here to answer any questions that you have. So please put any of your questions in the chat so that they can assist you and Sven can answer any um, questions as needed as well. And lastly, we don't send out recordings of the live workshop. Um, and this is because some of the material is personalized. However, Sven will provide links with the reference material we go over today, so you can work effectively after the workshop. So without further ado, I am going to hand it over to Sven. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so I hope everybody can hear me well. You can see so far what you can see. So I haven't shared any slides so far, but I want to talk about supply chain security. This is something. So by the way, um, I will have an eye on this chat. So if you have any questions, right? Where's my chat? Where's my chat? Oh, yeah, I have my chat found finally. So. I will have an eye on my chat window. And if I see any question, I will try to give an answer as soon as possible. And yeah, if it will take a few minutes, maybe it's just because I missed this window. Okay, so Bangalore, San Diego, Rockla, Poland, Rockla. I hope I pronounced it right, but Poland, yeah. Poland. So, from nearly everywhere. So I'm, I'm from Germany here right now and the weather is just bad, it's raining, it's raining. So let me search for my slides and then I will start sharing the screen. So this is a critical part, how to share my slides. So I'm trying to Okay, and go. So you should see my screen now. And I have to remove this one. And I have to search for my chat window again. God, this is always disappearing. Ah, here we are. Okay, I have it. So, okay, let's start. Oh, where's my, where's my, here we are. Oops. Next one. Okay. So, supply chain security is a big topic uh, these days, and especially during the last half year, it's, uh, it's even more critical. So, what what do we want to go through, and what what will be the topic here? So, what are the low hanging fruits if you want to start with security in your daily life uh, during the time you're developing? Uh, so, what are the quick wins? So, where where you should start with? Um, I will give you an overview of different. Um, uh, theoretical things that you can start reading about this stuff and have the first words. Uh, so this is an additional thing. And um, yeah, if it is now called DevSecOps or DevOps with security or whatever, uh, we, are, we are focusing here on, on the security part, okay? And then I want to start more or less with something that happened in the near past and uh, this changed a lot of stuff. So even with, with uh, formal regulations and all this stuff, we will talk a little bit about this one. We will connect it to the daily life, uh, what's going on. And uh, then I will go through uh, with you through all this um, stuff inside the JFrog platform where we will get information and what you can do externally. So to, to spread this information, the security re um, relevant information through all different tools. By the way, my name is Sven Ruppert. I'm a developer advocate and I'm based in Germany, as I mentioned, and mostly I'm running around in the woods. So every three minutes or if I'm recording some new uh, webinars or videos for my YouTube channel, I'm 
somewhere. So I was just last week in Sweden. So I'm just preparing a bunch of new videos uh, that are coming out for the next, uh, I think, all the next weeks. And yeah, so if, if you want to um, have additional information around this stuff, what I'm explaining here, have a look on my YouTube channel, but make sure that you're selecting the right one. I have one in German, and I have one in English, so make sure that you're selecting the robot in English. Uh, otherwise, maybe the German is uh, not enough for all the subtitles. So what happened? <clears throat> With this uh, SolarWinds hack, I'm not going into all details, but the SolarWinds hack uh, showed us a few things that's changed. And um, in, a, in a few words, um, there was this company SolarWinds, with this Orion platform, the software to manage networks, so customers of this company will have big networks, not only one server. And there's an agent-based uh, approach that is monitoring, managing the network infrastructure. So whatever. the they are producing software, so they have a CI system. And the CI system was a target of this hacker group. So there was a hacker group stolen a few tools from FireEye. It's a longer story, but in the end, they, they broke into the network from SolarWinds. And uh, instead of you know, destroying stuff or encrypting stuff with ransomware or whatever, they just went to the CI environment and manipulated the CI environment. And so in, in a way that with every new build, they created a compromise binary. And uh, surprise, surprise, a big company, everything is automated. They had... Uh, automatic update uh, provided to their 300,000 customers. And I think in a few days, they, they infected with this automatic update, uh, I don't know, 12,000, 13,000, 15,000, you're reading different numbers, but something in this range, definitely more than 10,000 customers in, in a few days. And this means more than 10,000 networks. And there was everything, the who's who, US governmental institutions, healthcare, automotive, uh, whatever. So, Space, military, defense, really, really everything. And so, what 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 is the key takeaway from this? Um, the key takeaway for us as developers is we have to protect now against two borders or so two two front lines. So one is make sure that you're not consuming malicious stuff or vulnerable stuff. I will explain the difference between malicious and uh, packages and vulnerabilities in, in a few minutes. But that you're not consuming this stuff, and on the other side, that you're not pushing this uh, stuff out so that you're not distributing it. And distributing uh, malicious stuff or vulnerable stuff um, is, is even worse for your financial situation in a company no? because uh, customers are losing trust. So we, we have to make sure on every stage that we are not consuming stuff and that we are not pushing out stuff at this point. Eh? And this is not easy. Not easy. Okay, so supply chain security is the main topic. So in general, what, what is supply chain? A supply chain is more or less everything from the idea until it's in production, third party products, ideas, design, development, whatever, the whole thing. And on this supply chain, how many targets or parts are in, have a mind that you are part of a supply chain. So you are part of supply chain, whatever supply chain. And sometimes you're not even aware of all the supply chains you are in, okay? Because it's a company you're working for, and then you're part of, I don't know how many supply chains. But in the end, uh, a few things changed during the last two or three years and uh, during the last few months, uh, dramatically again. So for example, this is attacks are more and more based on, on global events or they, they're using global events to attack worldwide and to try to make whatever they want to do. And um, what we can see is that this sub acronyms or this is uh, groups are more and more organized. So they, they are not only, uh, a longer time ago, it was more or less a few heads that are working in a group and they, they are doing the stuff, whatever they wanted to do. But now these groups are start organizing, they're sharing information, sharing resources, sometimes even heads. So um, this is increasing the quality and, and uh, the attacks, uh, the quality of attacks. On the other side, we have this expanding motives. Um, so earlier it was more or less, they wanted to make a denial of service. They wanted to whatever. So quite often it was money driven, okay. But uh, what we can see is during the time and um, for example, my uh, 
my brother is working in a cyber defense company that are analyzing uh, stuff like this, what's what's ongoing and active uh, cyber um, protection. And what they, they gave me as info is, for example, that they identify that more and more attacks, ongoing attacks, right now ongoing attacks are more and more political oriented. So it means that um, if, if you're in a small and medium business size company, uh, earlier days, it, it was more or less okay, you're tiny, nobody's really watching what you're doing. So it's just a tiny piece what you're delivering somewhere. But now with this increased hygiene uh, of this ecosystem of this big company, so during the pandemic and now uh, during the last few months, they increased the bar and they, so they, they invested a lot of money, they, they secured the whole stuff, their stuff. And that means that this increased barrier is now pushing all this stuff left and right in, in a way that uh, people are now attacking this very small companies to sneak in instead of the big companies. And um, having in mind what I mentioned before, this motives um, is more or less instead of money driven, more and more uh, political driven attacks are um, recognized. Uh, and it means that uh, maybe you're not uh, attacked by a tiny group, maybe you're attacked by a governmental supported organization from somewhere in the world. So it, it's really not nice. Um, and we have to do something against it. So okay, that, that's one thing uh, the most people are forgetting that we have this um, hardware approaches as well. I'm not covering this one here. But cloud infrastructure or hardware or manipulated hardware is, is some kind of supply chain security as well. But there's excluded here. So we want to focus now on this software supply chain security stuff. So what, what's going on for you as a developer? And if you're looking at this picture, I will explain this later on during the workshop a little bit um, more in detail. But here, this um, first of all, this picture is from the open source project uh, Salsa. It's an open source documentation project where a lot of um, information is available about typical attacks, uh, what happened, what you can do against it, and some projects, uh, some, some um, levels where you can uh, check on what level you are and what would be the next step. So project Salsa is, is a composition of security experts worldwide that try to write down their, their experience and, and their, their knowledge. So, but uh, going to this picture, we, we have more or less three big threats. It's uh, source threats, build threats, and dependency threats. And um, it's more or less, as a software developer, what, what uh, do you have in your hands where, where you can start with security? It's more or less, um, if, if you start writing code, then it's source code, what you have in mind, then you're pushing this code to some Git repository or whatever. This can be compromised, malicious uh, commits can be sneaked in um, before, before you're writing source code, someone can intentionally in, um, implement bugs, um, vulnerabilities, intentional bugs in the source code. So source code can be compromised as a Git repository can be compromised. From the Git repository, the source code will be transferred to the build system. Uh, on this uh, layer, something can happen, but on the other side, then you have this build system. This is doing all this stuff. And now what's, what's all is happening is source code will be converted to binaries and will consume binaries, you know, this dependencies. So, and from this, again, infrastructure is building binaries, is pushing this one to repositories, again, infrastructure, and then this binary will be pushed to the consumer. So in the end, we have three things in our hands as a software developer. We have source code, binaries, and infrastructure. With infrastructure, you have to decide by yourself if you're able to maintain it in, in a way that it's secure. So can, can you maintain your own Git repository in a way that nobody can break in the same with built infrastructure or should it be maybe better in cloud where, where other resources are invested to, to harden it and so on and so on. So, um, but this infrastructure. So in the end for us as software developer in daily life, if you're not constantly maintaining infrastructure, it's more or less your source code and binaries, okay? This, these are the two things uh, that you can go through. Uh, if you start reading about um, security, it's it's mostly in a way that you will um, teach four main main areas. Uh, so the first is the static application security testing. It means you have scanners, vulnerability scanners, or scanners for, for malicious code packages, obfuscated code detection, and all this stuff. And this uh, can you do with all the bits and pieces you have. Okay, you can scan everything what you are getting in your hand, and nothing must run. This is a static application security testing, source code, configuration, binaries, all this stuff, okay? Uh, what you're a little bit missing is uh, dynamic context of it. So the um, 
I will cover it a little bit later if, if you are talking a bit about what are prerequisites uh, in environment, in configuration, and in source code. But uh, this is more or less what you can do with Dust. Uh, and, and the opposite is that you start ramping up your application, looking from outside like a hacker and try to break into with the most common vulnerabilities or all the most common vulnerabilities like heat lamp, uh, SQL injection, whatever. And this is more or less a hacker approach. Tools here need access to your instance, what you want to test. Um, the runtime of this application is one of the limiting factors. So how, how much bandwidth you have so that you can attack your system with the cloud providers, how much resources you have to speed up the test itself and how many concurrent tests you can do. So this is more or less um, very uh, CPU intensive and network intensive. So it means resource intensive, so this dynamic application security testing. And this is uh, quite late in, in the stage because you need something that's already running, okay? If you're combining both, uh, this is why I made it gray. It's more or less uh, the interactive application security testing. It's uh, you're ramping up the application. It's like performance testing also. Yeah? So you're looking inside this uh, application, you're modifying the attack vector, you try to sneak in, you're changing things. But for this, you need very experienced people. So it's nothing what you're learning in a year or two and uh, before you can trust your <laughs> results. So you need very experienced um, people. And IAST is something that is not really scalable because you need human power. For every tick, you need someone who's really doing it, okay? So this is not freely uh, scalable. And then there's this last thing, what you will find is mostly called, or it's called RASP, this Runtime Application Security Protection. And as you can see here in the name, it's no testing anymore. It's more or less, um, I'm protecting uh, production. And this makes only sense on production because this is something to identify an ongoing attack. Okay, and it's mostly an agent-based approach. It's something like an APM tool. It's modifying a little bit the, the application to get metrics out of it. And with machine learning in real time, you try to identify if there's something malicious going on. So is, is there something that is not normal? And then you can do something like alerting or you can just shut it down. Okay, but well, this is to detect an ongoing attack. So uh, now, now where, where you should start with? RASP is something that is mostly not so cheap and it's only valid on production. So it it's, makes no sense to put RASP on a test system, okay? So this is one thing. So this is the last wall of defense. So this is nothing where you should start with. It's an additional thing, but nothing to start. IAST, the combination of dust and dust is more or less if you have experienced people with this very specialized knowledge, yes, otherwise don't do it because this is uh, something, uh, as I mentioned, with, with a lot of human power involved. And then you have dust and dust and dust is quite late. So something must run already and you need internet connection. It's very hard to do with, with air gap networks because most providers are cloud providers and it's very hard to modify the attack vectors of this tool set. Sometimes they're working a little bit with fuzzing so to identify stuff, but in the end, it, it's something that's pre-configured more or less. But what's very easy for you is if you're starting with static application security testing, you have this tool set, you have this tool set in your hands, you can have it locally, you can have it on your cloud instance or on-prem or whatever, and you can scan every component that is part of your stuff. So um, it's start to uh, time to start or to do some, some finger stuff. Um, I think we have somewhere this URL, I will post it into the chat, copy link, okay. Here we are. Okay, so uh, use this one so that you can start um, creating your free tier. Um, I will go in a minute through this. Let me search for my browser. Then we can start. Where's my browser? Where's my browser? Where's my browser? Cool. Right here. Okay. So, so let's go to do we had this one? So if you're going here through this, then we get uh, we'll get this screen. Uh, make sure that really cloud is selected. And uh, what you sh should do is that you are going here somewhere. Oh, that's a JFrog right here. Yeah. Then start with, uh, for example, sign up 
with Google or whatever, I'm using Sana with email. And in this field, what you can give is now name, family name. And uh, by the way, this, this syntactical stuff is just working with JFrog email addresses. It's not working with your email address. So um, then create, uh, use your email address. Uh, you will get a um, verification email through this email and then you have to activate this one. Choose a password and follow these instructions. The main thing what you have is more or less that you should select a server name and the server name should be as short as possible. Uh, so because this will be part of every URL that will be created. Okay, so make sure that you're not using this long thing. It's just inconvenient. Okay, so uh, during the time I'm explaining a little bit stuff, just follow those instructions, just type your server name, select AWS and uh, EU Central, and then let it go. In a few minutes, you will have it done. Okay, so please let me know. We're not so many people, so please let me know in the chat if you have started and done it, so that I know that we can start with practical stuff. Okay, so during the time doing this one, I will explain a little bit where we are going through and why, why I want to start with, with the stuff what I'm doing in a few minutes. So um, the main thing is that if you have this architecture, okay, then we have different layers. We have this uh, layers that are more domain driven and we have these technical layers. Cloud native is just an excuse. You can use cloud native, uh, monolith, whatever. It's always the same. Uh, cloud native is just an excuse. So um, is, if you have a bunch of microservices you want to compose, the human has to decide what, what is the secure composition of this one. So what use case should be uh, covered by which um, microservice and how this composition is done, what uh, use case should be external available, what should be internal available so that you have no services exposures. Uh, but tools are not good in really identifying it so far. So what use case should be, what microservice. So this is something that is security by concept, you have to do it, okay? Later, if you want to identify, if you have inside your infrastructure, something like services exposure, maybe tools can help. But the composition, what use case is one microservice a tool cannot decide, you have to decide. If, if you want to connect now this microservice and they start bubbling and communicating to each other, what, what the machine can do is it, it can encrypt the layers. So key handshakes, encryption of the channel and all this stuff. But the machine can't help you or the tools that can't help you to identify it's secure to send this to pieces of information over the wire, or should I use different channels, for example? The machine can't help there. This is something that's domain specific, and this must be done by you. But if you're going to the cloud infrastructure or containers, the machine can help more and more because uh, resilient patterns and best practice with infrastructure and all this stuff. So here the machines are getting better, definitely better. But where the machines are really good is inside this DevOps environment. So during the time you're coding stuff, so in your IDE, handling with source code and binaries and all this stuff, at this part, machines are really, really good, okay? So, but have this in mind, even here we have two dimensions. Uh, if you're talking about source code and, and then about the uh, use case itself, um, we are not covering, or it's, it's not covered, uh, if this use case itself is secure, so it's a domain specific security. So how to make this use case secure in a way that it can't be misused to get more taxes or whatever. But on the other side, the technical thing, how to deal with file IO and uh, can you sneak in with SQL injection, that the machines are very good, okay? The most people are forgetting the whole DevOps stack. That's exactly what uh, Solowinds happens. So uh, if you have a Jenkins, scan your Jenkins and harden it. Huh? So it's it's part of your infrastructure, it's part of your tool stack, and you should have an eye on this one, not only on the application, what you're creating by yourself. But one thing is very important. So with every convenience layer or technical layer you're adding, you're adding per definition zero or more vulnerabilities. There is no way to remove a vulnerability with a next additional technical layer. You can hide it, you can make it unaccessible, but you can't remove it. Okay, and this is a big thing. So um, have in mind with every techno uh, technology layer you're adding, you're adding zero or more vulnerabilities. Same with compliance. 
we are not covering this one here so much, but uh, compliance scanning. So making things against this one secure is, is the same approach. Huh? So domain specific uh, stuff is something where the machine is bad, technical things where the machine is very good, and a bunch of vulnerabilities. Each layer is just adding stuff. If you're looking at this one, what we have is more or less at every technology layer, what we have will have some kind of corresponding dependency manager. Could be Maven in your application or whatever you're using. And then Debian for the Linux environment, Docker, Helm chart, and so on and so on. And the most people, again, and the most projects, what I see is they're completely ignoring their own tool stack. So Where's the compiler? Where are your scripts? This can be in some kind of generic repository. Even this you can uh, model in, in Artifactory. And a complete release should maybe include not only the application and the source code and all this stuff, but maybe the corresponding compiler, JVM, and scripts as well. So uh, think about this tool sec in, in a way that you have some kind of generic repository. So a place where it can be stored and mutable with version and then you can make a release out of it. So in every layer, we have a huge amount of metadata. And this is one of the biggest difference compared to other competitors in the market that say, oh, OK, we, we are giving binary scanning and all this stuff. If you have this art factory, then we not only have access to this binary, but we have access to all the metadata around it means all this stuff. So, what dependencies you have, uh, is this in test scope, compile scope, uh, static linking, dynamic linking, whatever. So all this information that is part of a dependency management system will give you some context. And this context is later very important for contextual analyzers to identify what is really an activated vulnerability or not and all this stuff. So all this metadata, we have this in Art Factory since a long time. So it was a logical next step to plug in with an, uh, vulnerability scan exactly there because then we saw whole text stack with metadata, okay? So how to create repositories and why? Why this is the first step. Let's talk about local repositories. Local repositories, there are, you have two, two kinds of local repositories. The local repository on your machine, this .m2 folder, for example, if you have there this repository folder, if you're working with Maven, then you have binaries in, in this, um, uh, yeah, folder. Um, did you ever check if you haven't compromised binaries in your .m2 folder? It's a funny thing, I, I just wanted to tease a colleague of mine, so I compromised one of these jars once and pushed it in his .m2 folder, and he, it was really weird, so something was just inverted a tiny thing so that his tests are failing. And he was so angry about it because it took some time to, to identify it. Huh? So what, what was the last time you checked your own .m2 folder um, if, if there's no compromise binary? OK, side note. But the main thing, this is a local repository. If you're talking about Artifactory, a local repository is a repository that is inside Artifactory. OK, there's a local repository. So if I'm talking here about a local repository, I mean the repository that's under control of Artifactory locally. OK, and um, this is more or less something where you can push stuff in. OK, I, I'm putting my stuff there in this local repository. Yeah, This is where you're pushing your uh, Snapshots and freezes in. Okay, so just just a question: Who was able to create this free tier already? Please give me a yes plus or whatever, so that you can see that we can start working with the web UI. So no feedback so far. Okay, let's see. Okay, the other thing is done. One is done. Okay, creating the Poland. You are the winner. The first one. So, um, okay, let me cover just the uh, remote repositories and then we will switch. Remote repositories, they are the repositories to, to outside instance. So maybe uh, the remote repository is, or the really the outside standing repository is uh, Maven Central. And the remote repository inside Art Factory is something like a virtual proxy that's connected to these external repositories. And that's always to transfer binaries through your own instance to, to get it, okay? And that's a way to, to get it. This is 
remote repositories. And then you have local cache. It's inside Art Factory, it's a remote repository, so you can browse all the metadata. But in the end, you have a local cache and everything that was fetched all this virtual property is more or less stored there. Okay. The challenge with repository structures is how to populate stuff between different hierarchies. So um, if you have an hierarchy, how, how, how binaries are bleeding from one tree to the next one, okay? Um, it could be a challenge if, if you're making it way too complex and way too deep with, with this real infra um, repository structures, make sure that you find a strategy, what is the balance between having stuff locally and having stuff pushed through other, other environments, okay? So don't, don't make this tree too, too huge, okay? So, okay, let's start with the repositories. So, okay. Okay, so, um, yeah, we, we have uh, two, two UIs I will show you. Uh, one UI is uh, this one, the, the new UI, the repositories. And then there is a slightly older one. It's just, we're talking about maybe a week or two weeks. Um, it's looking like this, so don't be scared. It's just a slightly different UI, uh, but it has the same. So if you have a company a company installation, you will find the same stuff. It's a little bit different um, positioned inside the web UI, but it will show you slightly where, where is the difference. So if you're in a company and you're seeing a little bit older one, then you have this one. And if you are just working with free tier, then you're in this environment. So how to create repositories um, and why? Why should I use repositories? Okay, so why we're doing in a, in a few minutes, but how to create repositories because this is more or less a backbone for the whole stuff. Um, we have here the possibility to go to repositories after you log in, skip all this uh, quick setups and all this stuff, please. Um, because I want to show you really how to create this stuff without this, um, convenience function so that you really have everything under control. And then later you can use this quick setup and all this stuff. Okay, so we want to create a local repository. A local repository is the stuff where you're pushing your own stuff in and where you're pushing your snapshots and releases. So in the new UI, I go here to repositories. <clears throat> then you're going to add repository, local repository. Then you can select the type. We are working here with Maven. And then you have this repository key. A repository key is a unique identifier of this repository. And as I mentioned, it, it is, uh, must be unique. So make sure that you have a scaling naming schema over different technologies, okay? If you have release and snapshot, and if you have this with Docker and you have this with Maven, then the two names are colliding, okay? So this is why I have my personal naming schema. That's not the official naming schema from JFrog. It's not the perf uh, perfect one. It's not the whatever. It's just my personal um, way of building up a naming schema because I want to have the long names for local and remote repositories and the very short ones for the virtual one. I will explain why in a few minutes. So, so that I have a key, mostly I'm starting with the type and then if it is local or remote and then some, some, some name, some logical name. That's my way of building up this naming schema so that's uh, scalable over different technologies. Then you're going a little bit more down and then you have to select if you want to handle releases and snapshots. For example, we say this is a snapshot repository, a little more snapshots snapshots, okay. And then enable indexing with X-ray so that uh, vulnerability scanner will have an eye on this um, environment on this um, repository. Then going to advanced and here we have uh, two interesting things. First of all, allow content browsing. Content browsing is that you will see inside the web UI this repository and can navigate through the content. That's one thing. Then we have priority resolution. Priority resolution, what does it mean? Um, there is for malicious packages one attack that is done via uh, name squatting. Name squatting is more or less, um, you, you have internal dependencies, mycompany.com, uh, artifact ID, whatever. 
in the version one and you're delivering your project, then there's this binary in this jar and in this jar, you have all the metadata to identify a ah, group ID, artifact ID, and version. Or you have this information bleeding out of the company that's uh, just um, a colleague that left the company or it's information is sold or whatever. So this information is available outside. So if you have this product outside, let's say, let's say this binary, okay? You have this web archive or whatever, it's, it's outside available inside the product. With reverse engineering, you're, you're extracting this jar and it's just copy and pasting. Then you have this bytecode and then you're manipulating this bytecode in a way that you have some additional functionality, let's say like this. And if you want to get this binary back into the company, what you can do is, and it's actually, happening and this attack was very successful against all these big companies now and i mean the really big companies uh, it's more or less that you are going to maven central uh, with the same artifact and group id pushing your compromise binary with a slightly higher version number in so what, what's going on now so the attack is the following so you, you are requesting maybe your internal um, dependency and saying okay my my company then you want to check ah this other part of the company have say released a new version let's check the version and you see oh there's a new version available instead of one i have now one or two oh fine i'm using this one getting this uh, version what's going on now you're requesting your own internal repository and this internal repository will say, oh, I have just version one, but I'm asking my parent if there is a new version. Then it's asking the parent and the parent will maybe include the remote repository to Maven Central. Inside Maven Central, the repository will say, oh yeah, yeah, I'd fucking group ID, yes, I have. And the latest version is one dot, I don't know what I mentioned, two, one dot two or one dot three or whatever. And then we'll say, oh, there's a new version available. Okay, I'm requesting it. So now the compromise binary, which is internal dependency, is now going from Maven Central inside your own infrastructure and will be consumed. And if you're not modifying the, um, the functionality, then you've now compromised code inside. And to get rid of this one, you can say prioritize resolution. It means everything that's here will not be resolved from outside. Okay, and this is very powerful. Okay, then create this repository. If you have done this, or the same with remote repositories, remote repository, and then you go here to Maven again, then again, something like remote, Maven, remote, and then whatever, okay. Then you can add some uh, URL, for example, you can straight go to Maven Central, I will give you the URL, so here's the URL. Yeah, okay, the URL. And uh, if you have username password, you can add it, you can test your password and so on and so on. You can activate maybe even fetching jars if there's a dependency tree already that's already fetching and not only on request, it depends on you. Then handle snapshots and releases, whatever it's necessary. Enable indexing with X-ray so that um, X-ray is scanning this stuff. And again, here you have now the, uh, there's allow content browsing. And here, uh, mostly priority resolution is not activated here. It really depends what, what you want to do, but um, in Maven Central, I wouldn't do this one. So, okay, so then create this one and you have a remote repository. So if you have now a remote repository and you have this local repository. Mostly what, what's going on is that you have a bunch of repositories and this infrastructure uh, recommendations or um, behaviors are bleeding inside your uh, project. So you have example, uh, for example, different mirrors, uh, you have different uh, companies from JBoss, from Vardin, from whatever different, and you want, you don't want to maintain this um, stuff inside your projects. Why? Because all configuration or loss configuration or not maintained configuration is one thing where you can work with domain takeovers to, to sneak in with stuff. And it means you should have the definition of your repositories as, as small as possible, okay? So that there is no stuff bleeding. And um, then you have your internal naming schema and it's not influenced by the external ones and don't, you don't have to maintain in your projects uh, mirrors and all this stuff. This is done by virtual repositories. Virtual repositories are composite between local remote and other virtual repositories. And the cool stuff with virtual repositories is first of all, they're very lightweight. So um, in Artifactory, you have deduplicating between internal remote and virtual repositories. So you have a binary just once and then it's just an entry in different databases that makes virtual repositories very fast. 
and lightweight. And uh, virtual repositories, uh, they um, have this role-based access uh, concept. It means uh, if you have three uh, repositories, one, two, three, and you have user A, and user A has access to one and two, and user B has access to uh, two and three, and you're mixing one, two, and three in one virtual repository. Uh, if A is looking inside this one, you will just see content from one and two, and the other user will just see the content from two and three. <clears throat> this makes it very convenient and very easy to build a quite um, fine-grained structure to outside and a maintainable place inside Art Factory. So I'm switching between mirrors, I'm deactivating mirror because it's compromised or whatever. Okay. And how to create this virtual repository is here, add repository, virtual repository. Then again, selecting the type. Um, this is here then the shortest name, Maven Release. I have this already, so this is why I'm creating uh, zero one. And then you're selecting the repositories you want to have. For example, here for this releases, I want to use the local release. I want to have the Maven Central and go. And then here you have this default deployment repository. Default deployment repository means that if you are pushing through virtual repository, it will be redirected to the corresponding local repository. And here I have just one local repository defined. I'm selecting this one. And that's it. So if you're going to advance, you don't have this allow content browsing because virtual repositories are always visible inside the UI. Okay, good. Then you're creating it and then it's done. So what do we have with this one? We have with this one now a repository structure and the repository structure, why this is so important. So the repository structure is more or less, so here's the virtual repositories, so virtual repositories are very lightweight. We had this already um, so that you can uh, work with this and making this composite of repositories. The one thing is um, mostly if, if you start working with, uh, with software development, um, I have always the challenge, uh, should I write it by myself or should I add a dependency in all this? And on the other side, time to market, uh, it must be fast. So it must be fast. Uh, what I want to highlight here is, um, the software development teams mostly have the, the free uh, freedom or the, the, the permission to implement a use case. It's just, uh, you get this description, you're implementing this use case, and then it's up to you to push it to production and you're doing it because this must be fast and you want to charge your customers for these new features and so on and so on. And then there is a vulnerability and then, oh, a completely different process. Uh, you have to ask this per, for permission and that guy and doing this and that, and it's just slow. And what I want to highlight here is uh, see um, vulnerability uh, as a use case of requirements that must be pushed to as fast as possible to production in terms of killing the vulnerability. So this is what must be pushed. So the killed vulnerability must be pushed to production as fast as possible. So uh, makes a makes a process in the same way uh, lean. So make it easy, fast, uh, fully automated. Yeah? Don't don't do this. Uh, killing vulnerability things slow and with external additional process. Make or buy is more or less every developer has the same challenge. So should I write this PDF library by myself or should I add a dependency? And then I have two things. If I'm writing it by myself, okay, I can trust more or less myself or maybe my team, yes. And then I have to learn all this stuff. I'm doing all the mistakes other have done with creating a PDF library. So we have a learning curve. Um, it depends on the task itself, if this is a uh, short or long-term investment. On the other side, um, <clears throat> oh, I have, I'm not sending to all. Okay, so um, what I want to say here, make or buy. On the other side, um, the PDF library itself, um, if you're adding it as a dependency, the, it's maybe doing a little bit more what you're requested, but on the other side, you have to, um, make sure that you trust this binary, okay? Because it's an external thing. So, and mostly what we're doing, we are selecting by, because if you're looking at the whole text stack and comparing how many lines of code you're writing by yourself and how many of them are in external dependencies, you will see that in the most projects I saw of the whole text stack, mostly the, the most dominant part, 90 whatever percent is a binary. So in your application, a few lines, maybe 100 sort lines of code written by yourself and then a few million lines of code in terms of dependencies uh, operating system. You're just writing a few configuration, the rest are binaries. Docker starts with a from statement and then and, and. and the DevOps 
the part itself, what you can see is that your whole tool stack is a binary. So if you're looking at the whole tech stack, including your whole tool stack, by far the biggest part is based on binaries from externals and it's not your own source code. So if you're thinking about the low hanging fruit, the most effective way to start, start with scanning dependencies or start with scanning binaries, okay? Don't, don't scan your own source code and all this stuff. Uh, start with dependencies. If you're writing your source code, uh, follow the secure coding practices, okay? That's, that's a good thing to start. But if you want to scan for vulnerabilities, focus on binaries dramatically. Um, how, how to start scanning against this? Um, I'm, I'm not covering compliance here, but uh, vulnerabilities, what, what need, need to, uh, to be done? It's just the machine should have access to the binaries. The machine is scanning this stuff. The machine is doing it way faster than we are doing it. And then you will get a list of vulnerabilities and then you have to do something. Okay, and then your job starts. But all the previous work the machine can do. Okay. Um, if you're talking about compliance or vulnerabilities, compliance is the wrong license somewhere, and then you have to push some stuff out and you have to replace it with a semantic equal implementation. That's crap. So finding a semantic equal implementation is, is not easy. So you have to write anyway in a wrapper and all this stuff, but compliance changes are not so big. So it's very important to get compliance information as early as possible before you start using this stuff now of the whole dependency tree. Um, with vulnerabilities are a little bit different beast. To, to get rid of vulnerabilities, mostly you don't have to change the whole um, composition or the whole component. You have just to slightly change the version number, uh, if it's fixed or not. It could be in version up, update or downgrade. But the bad thing with vulnerabilities is that they can be combined to different attack vectors, okay? So the full amount of all vulnerabilities is not really what, what really is a workload. You have to identify what is a possible attack vector? What vulnerability can be actively used? So remediation and mitigation information is very important here. But you have the same composition of binaries, just in a different version of um, different composition of versions. Yeah? If you're looking at the lifetime of a vulnerability, the most effective part where we can do something is after this information is available and consumable for you. Um, how to get this information? Well, with vulnerability databases and uh, all the lifeline before vulnerabilities more or less out of scope of you, okay? So you have to optimize really the time from, I have this knowledge as fast as possible, how to get it faster, it's one thing. And then if you have it, how to kill it in production. I have a more detailed talk about this one on my YouTube channel. So uh, check out there this love lamp of a vulnerability. I'm explaining all the stages and all this stuff, but uh, in the end, more or less, we, we have to focus on killing this one. And the bad thing from the coding point of uh, view, so not only the secure coding practices is a very strong test coverage, because then you can just change the versions because in very effective dependency management is one of the best weapons against vulnerabilities, if you know there's a vulnerability, okay? So, and, and this information, how to get this information, I will show you now, and then how to consume this information. But one of the best safety belts for you as a developer is a very strong test coverage because then you can just switch the versions and then let it go. There is only one ex exception here is if you're talking about malicious packages. Malicious packages are not vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities are intentional or unintentional brought in bugs that you can misuse to get some, some different behavior. Malicious packages are really compromised, obfuscated code with additional functionality. So, and uh, they're slightly different. So vulnerabilities will have a CVE, a malicious package will not have a CVE. So no identity and all this stuff. I will go a little bit later to this, but uh, in the end, that's it. So um, let's see how we can get this information, how fast and at what is the point to get it. Let's assume we have some IDE. Oh, let me see, I have this on GitHub so that you can use this later for yourself. GitHub, GitHub, GitHub. Yeah, yeah, it's a thing. So let's see, all to all. Okay, this is a link to the, to the repository, so. Uh, you will find a bunch of information inside this readme, additional information over the time, so you, that you can rework on this stuff uh, anyway later. And um, I will focus now here on 
what what's going on. So if if you're if you're working, you you need this information as fast as possible. So you you need something that will provide you uh, the list of vulnerabilities. I will show you different ways to get these vulnerabilities and how you can work with this. And then you have to decide what is the best way for you to, to consume it or at what point. For example, if, if you have this, this repository, okay, and this is a Play Maven project. It's just a, a demo um, from, from Helidon, it's an open source project. And it's, it's an old one, but then I can show more vulnerabilities, okay. They are quite good with maintaining. It's not to blame them or whatever. It's just I'm using a big open source project with a bunch of dependencies with prepared Docker images so that I don't have to do it by myself and then just scanning and see what's what's going on. Okay, so <clears throat> inside <clears throat> this one, you will get some um, repositories. Okay, so for example, we have here this repository and I'm just created here my, my instance, what you saw in the web UI. This is why I mentioned take a short server name because this is everywhere. I will show you how to get this URL. I, uh, give me a second, I will show it to you. How to get this URL, so this URL you will get. If you're here in Artifact Tree and you're going to Artifacts, then we'll see all the defined repositories. And here, for example, this Maven release, if I want to go through this, what you will see is here, first of all, all the information, including metadata. And if you're going to, I don't know, something here, then you will see here, this item is not cached. Because this view is a virtual proxy that will show you all the metadata, including everything, okay? And the corresponding Maven, yeah, it's Maven really Maven removed. I have this Maven. Oh, this. I had a typo here. Maven uh, removed Maven Central. I have to this one a Maven uh, removed Maven Central cache. So this is a view on the remote with all the metadata. It's just a virtual proxy. Oh, that's slow on my machine. Here. Okay. And this one is a cache. So what I requested over this one already, and then you will see a slightly different view, and then you will get more metadata about um, some, some stuff that's here. So uh, fingerprints and all this stuff. If you want to clean your cache, you have to go through this one, and then you can do here with right click. You can work here on content. For example, you're going here to content, and then you can say, okay, I want to delete this version or whatever. Uh, we have here a trash can. So if you deleted something accidentally, you can recover it here over the trash can. And here in this virtual repository, you will see the whole content. And this is what we want to use. So you can go here to this one, copy this one, or you, what you will find is set me up button. And this set me up will give you the possibility to generate stuff for configuring. And this is depending on the repository you're selecting. For example, if you're going to Docker, I'm going to set me up, set me up, then we'll see here no, to configure, to push and to pull information. So you will get always for all the corresponding uh, repository and technology, you will get information how to connect. So with this one, uh, after you created a user or logged in with a user you have already, then you're copying this one here and then it's mostly connected inside your settings XML. For sure, you have to do all the authentication authorization stuff. But what is a developer doing? A developer is going to this dependencies here, okay? And this dependencies is more or less something, yeah, well, there, there, there is something, okay? So the main thing is we have, for example, inside the IDE and plugin, uh, you can go here over preferences. It's in VS Code, uh, IntelliJ, uh, Eclipse, whatever, you will get this. And then you can go over the plugins and searching here for, for JFrog, installing it. And then over the global configuration, you can go here and using username and password to connect. This can you do with your, with an enterprise trial, with your enterprise company thing, with your free tier. So with all instance, you can do it, okay? So here I have my regular instance so far configured. So um, that's not exactly what I'm using here in my, my web UI right now. I'm just too lazy to, to retype this stuff. That's all. Okay, so if you have configured this one, you will get this plugin. 
And this plugin will read the metadata information. And you will see here something for solving dependency tree and so on and so on. So let me see. Nah. Okay, so it will take some time. So over the network, it depends a little bit on your network. So and the first time you're connecting this stuff. But in the end, what you will get is you will get here the full dependency tree inside your technology. And inside this one, you will get this information about, oh, here is, for example, a vulnerability. And if you have this vulnerability, you will get information about this one is fixed. And you see here is a dependency path. Uh, you can have this uh, references for additional documentation. You will get some information, not the whole information that's available inside the web UI. I will show you in, in a few minutes. But inside the IDE, you can already um, work with this. And if you have this one, you say, okay, Meticodic, I want to remove this one. Then you can show in project descriptor where it is. And what you can do is you can exclude it. So. Um, my laptop is a little bit slow, sorry for this. But here I see uh, in this web client, okay, inside this web client, there's a transitive dependency and you will get this marker here as well. If you want to exclude it, what you can do is, oh man, this is really slow my machine. So exclude dependency. And then you will get this exclusion. Uh, the next step, what you have to, to do is you have to redeclare really a new version that is more or less um, shortest pass in Maven. It depends on the dependency manager you're using. Then you can start dependency and here you add exactly this stuff, what you want to have and the version. And then what, what's the version here? 4168, 4168, for example, fine. Okay. Okay, and then you are modifying the dependency path here. So this you can do until everything is um, removed. So that's one way to to work with this. If you have to um, if you have to kill vulnerabilities in in the deep inheritance tree or in the deep dependency tree, then you can really create um, on on top. It depends a little bit if you are talking about Docker, if you are talking about different things. You have different ways to do it or npm or whatever. Um, but maybe it's more or less uh, what you need to know is um, if your dependency manager has something like a declaration uh, order or shortest pass or whatever, no? how it works. So it depends on the dependency manager. With, with Maven, it's quite simple. I'm just excluding it in all places where they have it. And then I'm just adding this one uh, here as well. Okay, so if you're working with this one, then you can modify the dependency tree. And this is why I'm mentioning um, uh, test coverage is very strong because if you're redeclaiming this stuff and the test coverage is strong, then all tests are green again and you are good to go. And then you have to uh, think what, what is the best compromise between uh, updating, downgrading version, mixing versions, uh, removing dependencies, stuff like this. Okay, so this is how it works inside the IDE. This is quite easy. Yeah, because you have this information immediately. So you're adding a dependency, you have immediately the whole dependency tree and you can start cleaning it up and you see if this is something for you, yes or no, and versions and so on and so on. So uh, this is really shift left. So quite early in your pipeline, you can just um, yeah, kill vulnerabilities without writing one line of code that is consuming this dependency. That's one thing. Okay, so. What other things do we have to, to get vulnerability informations? We have, for example, the possibility to do all this stuff over command line. Um, so all functionality uh, from Artifactory, Ectray, and so on and so on is available via REST API and uh, over on command line interface. The command line interface you will get over, let me search, I will give you the URL, JFrog CLI. Just search at Google for JFrog CLI. And then you will get this one. I will give you the URL ah, here, the CLI. And from here, you have more or less a way to um, download all this stuff. So what, what we have, we have, for example, the CLI will give you access to command line stuff. And we have the installers. There's this download size, JFrog CLI download site. We'll give you this as well. So I can see a line here. And what you can do here is you can select what is the installation stuff you like to, to use or just the binaries. 
And uh, with it, you can um, connect through your uh, artifact in E3 instance and start scanning all this stuff. How to do this? For example, if we have, well, yeah, it's just pushed. So let's see, ah, I'm just doing it. So, okay. So if if I have something like this, so uh, the first thing what, what I need to do is I have to configure or install the JFrog CLI. I'm showing it to you here because it's taking only a little bit. It depends on if you have Windows, if you have Linux and all this stuff. So I'm showing it here so that you are aware of this stuff and you can do it then uh, by yourself. Um, but inside the workshop, mostly this is killing the time with different uh, operating system all this stuff. But in the end, if you install the binary, you have to write down JFrog config uh, add to add a configuration, there you are adding your server name and your credentials, and it's just more or less like, like a, a wizard that you have to follow on command line. And then you have the connection done. If you have uh, this done, then JFrog, JFrog, then you can add or see what configurations you have. For example, I have here two configurations, my, my main thing I'm working with, and then for example, the instance, what I've created for the workshop. And um, you can switch what is the default with JFrog config use, and then you're using this name, this ID, the server ID. Uh, then you can switch between uh, configurations. And this means you can add your company thing and your private thing and everything, and you're just switching uh, between this. So here, this is now the default. What are we using here? This one. The next thing is, if we are at this point, what, what we can do is I can just um, check the POM, what I have here, this POM XML, what I modified or what I want to work. If I want to check it without an IDE, I can do it on command line. And I'm just saying, okay, please, JFrog, audit my Maven thing. Okay, audit minus MVN. So what's going on here is now that um, oh, I need uh, Java, Java, I locally uh, using um, Java to manage my JDKs. So that's really a neat, cool open source tool. I have a bunch of JDKs installed and then I can switch with Java. So that's the only thing that happened right now. Okay, so I can I can wrap now with the JFrog CLI, this is Maven command. So what's going on here is it's start analyzing the POM XML, getting all the dependencies uh, information, all this stuff, and will give me the vulnerability report on command line. So you see here, oh, I have here some Netty codec stuff. I have a fixed version, I have, and so on and so on. And then it will uh, get this X-ray ID. So it's a more or less an identifier. Or if there's a public available CVE, then I can use this one. And if you want to have more information about this, the easiest thing is that you're just going to the internet. Oh, come on. Oh, that is slow. So yeah, going to the internet typing this uh, CVE, and then it will get mostly the official documentation about the CVEs itself, okay? And then you can start reading about what, what's really in the background, okay? So what's what's happening here? So that is quite interesting and um, easy. You will see the CVSS values, uh, version two and 3.1. And um, what you're not getting here on command line is the CVSS vector to identify why this is so, so that you can start working with environmental metrics. Um, but you will get all this information here. The next thing what is very interesting to, to uh, do is you can export this one. For example, if you want to have uh, this one, what do you, uh, just piping this stuff out, We'll make an audit, type JSON and pushing it here to output JSON. Then we'll get this in as a JSON file. And so you can consume this information. I will show what, what you will get here. Where is this one? I think it's a good. So let's see where, where do I have it? Output JSON. So what you will get is here exactly the information so that you can consume it with some other um, machines. What you will get additionally, and this is what I mentioned a few seconds earlier, on the uh, terminal, you will get just a CVSS value, for example, but you're not getting the CVSS vector. 
And inside the JSON, you will get already the vector so that you could analyze it if you are able to read this one. And you will get all this, um, yeah, vulnerability information there on this one. So the next thing is that we can say, okay, I want to create something and that is called build info. Build info is a superset of an SBOM. I have some slides to SBOM. Let me see, let me see to, to explain what I mean. So um, here, for example, um, during the solar wind hack, what, what we got is that so many different uh, governmental institutions from the US government were attacked that the president gave this executive order of cyber security. An executive order is something like, um, uh, imagine the, the US government is, is a company and the CEO is a US president. What the CEO of a company can't do is he can't change the law, huh? but he can change the way how this companies operating. And this is exactly what an executive order is. With an executive order, the president can cannot change law, but he can change the way how this uh, government is working. And that was done with the executive order of cyber security. And the main thing is that, um, or the short version is every software that is operated, used, produced, uh, whatever by, by, by the US government must fulfill this SBOM, the software builds of material. This is a full list of ingredients. So if I'm adding a dependency, I need all the transitive dependencies with all the versions and fingerprints, all this information. And then I can provide this SBOM. I will show you how to extract this SBOM here out of this um, web UI. But the main thing is that is a requirement for everything that will be directly or indirectly used by the US government. Okay, I'm not working for the US government, but I'm creating an open source library and I want to make sure that this open source library is easy to consume. Then I can provide this as bomb with my project, just as a service. And you can create it with your uh, feed here, just with, with mouse click. We know this since a long, long time. And uh, this, uh, we choose the name build info because SBOM was not fancy during such days, it's just fancy during the last year. And build info is a superset of SBOM because if you have this binary and you want to see why from time to time I have this flaky thing, so I have from time to time a, a strange binary, then it's good to know, oh, this binary is always built on build agent three, okay? So what I mean here is you need meta information about the context of uh, during the time you're creating this binary, you, you're collecting meta information of the context information so that you can analyze it. You can show uh, what's the difference uh, in configuration, what was uh, date, time, library, whatever you want to collect. You can a little bit, um, yeah, um, you can modify the way what, what is collected. You, we have Jenkins plugins and uh, whatever. But in the end, the main idea is you have immutable information and you have mutable information. The immutable information is the library version, operating system, daytime, whatever the binary itself. And the mutable information is the um, actual vulnerability database. Huh? What, because if I'm creating a binary now with my knowledge of vulnerabilities and it's green and I'm pushing it to production, but next day, the vulnerability database may be updated because we have no uh, things found, then the build info will be read. And without scanning production, you can just see, okay, this binary is now read because now we have the information inside the vulnerability uh, database and who is consuming this binary. And then you need all the tiny places where this binary is used, okay? And this is part of the build info. And that, that's really cool how to, how to do this one. First of all, we want to create this build info. Where's my mouse? Where's my build? Oh, here, yeah. okay. So I want to create this build info. You can do it, um, uh, for example, uh, inside your IDE, or you can do it uh, here in, in the terminal or CI environment. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating here a build name that is, for example, here my logical name of today. This um, build workshop and a build number and CI system would increment this one. I'm doing it now manually. But the main thing is that you have this J4 command and this is wrapping the Maven clean verify command. Okay, so it's a wrapper around this um, command and this is collecting all this metadata. Okay, so if I'm doing this one, then I'm doing my clean verify and uh, during the time it's collecting all this information. And what I'm doing as next is that I'm taking this one and publishing it. 
Okay, so because I can publish it to my to my um, at factory instance, then I have this information um, stored in an immutable way. So I'm using now exactly you now this workshop and build number what I created here, and I'm publishing this one. You will see this in the readme for sure. Don't don't. Uh, and I have it inside the to do of this uh, readme file in the project. So what what we will get now is. We will have here um, under Artifactory this builds menu point. And here we are collecting all this information about the builds. I have this workshop. Okay. And now I have two builds huh? one I've prepared before the workshop and one that is created right now. So it's, it's not scanned. It will take a few seconds, but I've done it before. So check here. So what I have, I have this binary, this jar. Um, I can collect environment variables and all this stuff. I haven't done it right now. Uh, be careful with sensitive data stealers if you have too many environment variables in, in your build infrastructure. Then I have uh, effective permissions, the build info, the whole information is JSON and I have this X-ray data. And now we are going to how the web UI is presenting additional advanced security information or enriched security information. So I have here violations. If I have something like uh, defined, we haven't defined something with a license or whatever, so that's zero. But we are scanning for vulnerabilities at this point. So securities um, is, for example, here, this is list of vulnerabilities. And if you see the green one, this is enriched with the security research team. Otherwise, this is a pure JFROX um, found vulnerability from our research team. And this is a regular CVE. So uh, let's go here, for example, this is codec. What you will get is we'll get a summary. Sometimes it's a longer text where you can identify, okay, what's going on here. You will get details sometimes with pieces of code to see how to consume this library function in a secure and unsecure way. So that is more or less help for you as a developer how to consume this stuff or what you shouldn't do. Your remediation and mitigation information sometimes, and sometimes you have this uh, severity reason. So why the JFROG research team think it's very critical or not and so on and so on. Okay, so source and advisory we have here is more or less the same vulnerability information. Okay, it's it's fixed in some higher version. We have additional um, description, all this stuff. Impact path is more or less where it is used and who is using it. So the impact path and the references. Huh? So uh, references is um, advisory, so additional documentation, so that you can <clears throat> read more about this one. For you, in a practical way, what's interesting is more or less the CVSS values, but if you're looking at this one, the whole CVSS vector. This is a base metric. That's not the temporal metric. That's not the environmental metric. The base metric is more or less inside the CVSS, the worst case scenario of this vulnerability. If you want to know more about uh, all these tiny things here internally, on my YouTube channel, I have a video that's called, I think, CVSS metrics explained or so. And then you can uh, check out what what's all these uh, different things and how to uh, use it. And uh, the, for you, uh, the interesting thing is more or less to, to start reading this one to, to identify if this vulnerability is critical for you, if you have to do it by yourself, okay? So for example, do you need privileges to do it? No, you don't need, this is the critical thing. No? Do you need a user injection? No, I don't need a user injection for this one and so on and so on, okay? So this uh, was, uh, a little bit, train it a little bit, try it a few times, then, then you're able to read the CVSS vector in, in, in a faster way. An additional thing that's very interesting is operational risk. Um, if you have a dependency, uh, you have the vulnerabilities, okay, and then you want to remove the vulnerabilities, but on the other side, you have some point that's called operational risk. It's more or less um, an identifier how healthy the open source project is. For example, here, if I'm looking at this one, uh, then I see here, for example, I'm just uh, taking the first one, this dependency here has a high risk. The version I'm using is this one. The latest version is this one, but since a long time, they are not able to identify commits or committers of this open source project. So there is no activity. So what, what are the, the metrics of this? Um, 
operational risk. Um, is there any activity in terms of commits or whatever in this open source project? Yes or no. And if it is so, how often you have something? How many new versions are available based on your version? I'm using version A, but version D is already available. How often you will get new versions every year, every month, every two days, whatever, so that you need it. Is this version uh, registered as end of life? Well, you're using still struts one, uh, then this is definitely end of life. Huh? So all this information um, put together, it will give you an overview how, yeah, how good this uh, open source project is or how healthy, that's a word what I was searching for, how healthy the open source project is. And this is something different to vulnerabilities. It could be that there is no vulnerability, but it could be that this Pinsy, what is used, is freaking old. And it's good to know if this dependency that is not maintained is indirectly used by a dependency you're using. You know? so, and this will give you the whole operational risk metrics. What are the other points to come to this one? So we, we had this in Artifactory now, this, um, uh, let's see, yeah, this build information. Uh, I wanted to show how to uh, create this S bomb, this S bomb here. Now you see it's, it's now scanned. It really depends on um, how far this stuff is. So where's this action? They changed a little bit to UI. This is why I'm searching a bit for how to extract this one. It's, no, no. Okay, so I have to I have to check where where this um, export S bomb thing is. I'm just searching it in this new UI. So um, I changed it a few days ago. So, but you have here the full JSON with all the information, so that you have this available. So, going to X-ray itself. X-ray itself will give you additional information in terms of or different ways to consume this stuff. For example, you can create watches and violations. Watches and violations is more or less, you have different repositories. Uh, it could be a combination of Maven, Docker, whatever repositories, or all project repositories, or just a technology or whatever. And then every time the content of the repository is changing, as uh, the vulnerability database will get an update or you're manually triggering it, this watch will be um, yeah, updated. This watch, I will show you how to create one. But uh, so that you can see what, what's inside in this watch, you have uh, more or less a constant view of the actual state of this repository. You would see, ah, here this in, what's the impact graph, what is this, what is that, and so on. Okay. And how to create it. And then you will see how uh, or what you can do with this. With watches and policies, if you want to create a, a new uh, watch, what you need is a policy. A policy is a composite of rules. Rules are stateless actions. What should happen if I'm identifying something? So call it very useful demo. Uh, on a free tier, you have just security. Um, later, if you have Enterprise Pro on uh, Enterprise Trial, you can choose a uh, scan for license or for operational risk. You're doing it with the security, with the vulnerability stuff right now. And then I can add new rules. Every rule will get some name. Very useful. And this, um, what you can do is, if you have compliance documentation, you can map now this documentation through uh, policies and rules. So this chapter, this rule, and this chapter, that rule, and so on and so on. Okay, so you're giving it a name, then you can select in this predefined ranges, what kind you want to have, or you can select a CBS score. I just want to have from 4.7 to, I don't know, 8.1. If it makes sense or not, I'm not discussing right now, but um, you have to select different regions. You, what you can do is you can say from CBS score A to B, I just want to have an email from uh, C to D, I want to break a build and so on. This is why you can select here the CBS scores. So <clears throat> then you can select here this one only if um, fixed versions are available, otherwise just ignore it. Mm. The interesting thing is more or less that you can trigger webhooks. So you can ping something externally that is doing something. You can notify in different ways with emails, whatever you can create a Jira ticket and you can start blocking download and you can block 
release by the distribution. So if you're creating releases, it's what we are not covering here because uh, we are focusing on the free tier, not on enterprise features. Uh, but then you can do this one or in the CI environment, you can fail a build. Okay, so you have different possibilities here for this. I would just say here just um, generate violations so that you can see it inside the web viewer. That's the minimum what you have to do. Okay, if you have now created these different things, what happened? Okay, send me emails, do this, do that, uh, break a build, all this stuff. What you're doing is then, I, I have this created already. Then, yeah, discount. So then I can start creating watches. So the rules and policies are stateless and without any technology. They are just defined on the CVSS vectors. Um, then I can go through my um, repositories and can combine the policies with repositories. And this is called watch. So this combination, so I can use a policy in different watches. So a watch itself is more or less, if you're creating a new one, again, a very good name. And you can say here, I want to be notified if there's something or I can connect with Jira. And then I can connect resources. I want to scan repositories, builds or bundles. Let's say repositories, then I'm selecting some repositories. It could be all project repositories or just Docker repositories, whatever. And then I'm combining this one with policies. Let's say, okay, please fetch everything, save. Okay, if I'm creating this one, then this watch will be created. I've done this already. And then you see here now, I have this watch already, I have repositories in and I fetch everything. That is what, what I created. And then I can see under watch violations, what is the content. So with this, we are now able to combine the, the stuff what should happen with repositories. And I'm actually seeing what, what's going on, okay, on the whole thing. The next thing, if you want to have just a report, I want to have a snapshot now because you need to create a report for documentation or you want to send this information to someone, then you can create this report. This is a one-time snapshot report, giving it a name, my perfect report. Then again, you can, depending on your, um, on your license, what you have, scan for different things. We are scanning for vulnerabilities vulnerabilities inside repositories. I'm selecting maybe all my Docker repositories. So maybe here my Docker Hub and Docker Local, maybe something like this, saving. Then I can customize this report in a way I just want to check for one dedicated component or in CVSS core with fixes, without fixes, whatever. And then I'm generating this report. If I'm generating this report, we'll get this one-time shot it will say, okay, so many artifacts at this point were here, it's completed. And then you can check this one. You will get this list of all this stuff. And the interesting thing is more or less that you can export it. Okay. So and then you can work with this vulnerability information at this point. And then we have one interesting thing. Let's say, okay, let's go here back. If we have created Docker image I created. Where's my Docker image? I'm not doing it now because it's just slow on my machine. Okay, I created a Docker image, blah, 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 blah. I've done a lot of stuff. So then this was more or less this Docker image here. Okay, so it's an official Docker image from, from the Helidon project. Uh, I just had to add my repository coordinates. So that's not going to Maven Central, but it's going over my repository. That's the only thing I have to change. For example, here for this, what I created today, or oh, this my regular one, so that all Docker images are fetched over my artificial instance. And I'm creating repositories in the same way I created with Maven, so a local one for the deployment, a remote one to Docker Hub, and a virtual one where I'm aggregating all this stuff. <clears throat> so if this is in building, what I can do is I can um, export this Docker image file. Uh, so maybe I'm creating locally a Docker image from different resources and not fetching over Art Factory, maybe, or I'm getting a Docker image from someone or whatever. Either one, I don't know what, what's inside. And I want to analyze now what, what's going on here. What is with this Docker image? What I can do is I can use this Docker save command. I'm pushing it this here to, to this one. So this typical Docker save command. And with this Docker save command, what I'm doing, I'm grabbing this image and storing it as a binary, as a tar, okay, that's it. Um, I can analyze it. 
I can analyze this image in the same way I uh, analyze maybe my jar. It's always the same syntax, jfrog s for scanning and then the binary I want to scan. And here I'm just scanning this uh, Docker image. And if I'm scanning this Docker image, I uh, have done this before, but it looks like this one. No vulnerabilities found, what I've done does not, does not exist. I cleaned it, shit. Okay, sorry. Um, I've done my clean verify. So this uh, Docker image, I have to export it. Let me export it. I'm using exactly this one. Sorry for this. And so where's my Docker save? I'm exporting this one from my Docker instance. So I'm exporting it. It will take a few seconds. And then you will see here, here my export tar, okay? And now I can scan this one. So, okay, now I'm scanning. So what, what's going on? So you can scan your jar file, you can scan your Docker image, whatever. The good thing is that um, if you have something from outside, and you have just a possibility to scan inside Art Factory. The challenge is that you have something that's maybe um, corrupted uh, in, or yeah, with malicious code or with vulnerabilities. And then you're taking this binary and pushing it to Art Factory. The, the main thing is that now this binary is inside your infrastructure. And maybe you don't want to do it because you say, okay, if I have it on my machine, it's it's one thing. I created just this OK image or I got it or whatever, but I don't want to push it to my infrastructure so that nobody is able to misuse it or just accidentally using it or whatever because I have no clue what's inside. I can scan this stuff on my machine with the full capabilities of X-Ray. So it's uh, just deflating everything, analyzing the boundaries and connecting to X-Ray and asking what's, what's going on here. And um, then I will get exactly the same report again, so this command line report. But on the other side, what I will get is I will get this on-demand scan report inside my UI as well. And this is only one scanning here. And here, what I will see here just a few minutes ago, I, I created this one a little bit um, earlier. Yeah, I just scanned a jar, for example, there was nothing in because it, it was a clean jar. But here, for example, this Docker image, I found something, okay. Or the other uh, Docker image here. So whatever. So you will get always this um, overview. And then you will get here, for example, this security information. And again, you will see, okay, here is something and so on and so on, okay? So the good thing is that you will get this um, information persisted inside Art Factory. You can share it with your colleagues. You can discuss it with your colleagues. You can analyze this stuff. You can create it on your local machine without infecting the whole infrastructure because you have it just here and you can check what is inside, who's using it, what is using and so on and so on. So this is a very, very powerful tool because you can do it without any IDE. You can script it, whatever. You can do it on an DMZ machine that is just grabbing stuff as a satellite from outside, doing this stuff first before it's uh, brought in. So, uh, by the way, any any questions so far? No. Okay, let's see. Okay, so that's one thing. Okay, so um, yeah, build info we had. It's it's um, you will find on my YouTube channel for sure a little bit more about this. But if you are going back to to this picture what we had in the beginning, so if if I have to start with security and and I, I want to see what 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 is the low hanging fruit? I have three components. Oh, I have this infrastructure, I have source code, and I have binaries. Binaries are the biggest part, and scanning binaries everywhere. It's one thing that is helping you to, to kill the most vulnerabilities in, in your system. And there is, uh, this is a project that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's very good for, um, documentation project. So have a look there and, and read, you will learn a lot. And it's still an alpha phase, but it's already really, really good documentation. And then implementation of this um, uh, supply chain security is so an open source project for open source supply chain security. This is called uh, Persia. It was initially created by JFrog, donated, I think, to the CD Foundation right now. 
and uh, different parties are now working on this. Uh, the basic idea is that uh, from, from this one, if you're looking here from the point B or C, let's say C, from the point C, the build threads, um, this project is addressing to, to harden. Uh, for open source projects. So imagine you have somewhere in Git repository, we are not checking if the code is compromised or if, if the Git repository is compromised, but from the point you're giving an URL and a commit, you can download this source code. The Persian network, you're pushing this one to the Persian network, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. Then it's grabbing the source code with different nodes randomly selected inside the peer-to-peer -peer network. Then they start building this stuff here, then they are start building this one, and then they're comparing the binaries. And if all binaries are the same, then no, no um, build infrastructure was compromised huh? because you have no control which which node is building it, even if you're donating build nodes uh, through this network. You don't have the control about all of them. So um, this is P2P network is making sure that the build infrastructure is not compromised, the build uh, is done, and if on all nodes that are selected for the build, uh, the binary is the same. It will be pushed to the distribution layer and will be available for you. How to deal with uh, dependencies, threads, and binaries? So all binaries that are selected during this build can be part of the Persian network itself. So then it's full trusted more or less because it was built inside the Persian network without any external dependencies. Every external dependency is some kind of flecked off yellowish well, because it's grabbed from somewhere and inside this prison network you have this metadata that you can say okay this this one was compromised this is a red uh, don't use this one flag it as as um compromise also so this this is building a network of trust over the whole dependency tree and you can fetch over persia your Docker, your Maven, whatever dependencies. So this is a very interesting project and um, the whole history will be stored more or less in, in some kind of um, um, uh, some kind of blockchain. Oh, here, here's a question, okay. Question related to SBOM. What is the source of hash checksum inside SBOM file? It's uh, equal to artifactory checksum or calculated on the fly. No. So inside the SBOM, so here, uh, I think it's, I have to check which one it is. Let me check. So X-ray, now it was in. Uh, da, 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 da. Factory, say so builds. Uh, it's, um, SH something and let me see. Oh, oh, you can't see it here. Sorry. So I'm just going here. So build in for JSON. So inside the SBOM, we have the same hash sum here. as a one SHA and so on and so on. Okay, and MD5. This has a typically um, fingerprints that are used and um, you have two SBOM specs, um, cycle something and something. Uh, wait, let me see in the old UI, it was more or less here. Let me see if I have something here prepared. And um, this SBOM, this SBOM is more or less, I don't know, builds, do I have some builds prepared? I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Let's see if I have something prepared here, build info. Building for where is this action action thing? It's right. Uh, it's good here. Yeah, I, I haven't prepared something, but then you have this um, export SBOM, and then you can select these two different um, um, specs you want to fulfill, and then you will get this um, fingerprints. Um, and these fingerprints are uh, generated here inside Art Factory. So if, if there's a binary, we are generating the fingerprints and we are comparing with official fingerprints and so on and so on. So, and inside the SBOM file, it's equal to Art Factory checksum, yeah. So it's based on the binary itself. So I hope I could give you an answer. So with this SBOM where we was, oh, so, okay, so um, SBOM. So yeah, this is, that's a Persian network. And then what I had was, yeah, inside the IDE. So uh, the main idea is try to push this information in this tools you have and you're working mostly in. 
Uh, that's that's good because then you're not switching between different tools. You're just using this information inside your own tool stack, and um, you can save a lot of time, a lot of time, uh, if you have it already inside your IDE. So check out if you have access to the IDE plugin if you're using the right IDE. Um, the command line interface, uh, even if if you're using an IDE that's not supported, I think VS Code, Eclipse, IntelliJ, whatever. Um, then you can use this information immediately on command line without an IDE, even there, check it, make it consumable. Whoever in your team is working in, on which stage inside the DevOps platform and using what kind of tools, make this available uh, information available to everyone uh, so that everybody can, can work with this. Oh yeah, this, this I forgot. For example, if you're more an ops guy and you have this uh, Docker stuff or you're working with Docker desktop, even there we have this JFrog extension then you're connecting to your X-ray again, and then you can scan the images inside the Docker desktop environment. Okay, so that's that's more or less uh, the core thing. So you have this information in different ways presented as on demand, as build info, as uh, watch report, whatever. A thousand ways to consume this data. The good thing with X-ray is that you can um, build workflows with this trigger webhooks and being available by REST API. Then you can build workflows, you can extract information, you can feed it with information and so on and so on. So it's, uh, it fits really inside your infrastructure and uh, with the REST API and CLI command, you, you can just easily integrate it, even, even on this level. No? Okay, so um, anything left? No, no. If you want to know more, I really would like to see you on my YouTube channel as a subscriber. It would be perfect. A bunch of videos I'm just creating because I was for one week in Sweden to create it. I think more than 30 new videos. Uh, so there's something in the pipeline. I'm just editing this stuff, so it's coming. If you have any questions, maybe next days or whatever, what was this, what was that, um, feel free to contact me. Um, Twitter, LinkedIn is good. Uh, as comment on YouTube is good. What's really bad is email. Email is just not working for me because I'm just overloaded with emails. You know? So please, please try to avoid email. But on the other side, everything uh, is available. If you have any questions left, let me know. So we are more or less good in time. I showed everything I wanted to show to you and uh, you have the free tea, you can start. Inside this project I shared with you, there's this readme and there I have um, more or less everything um, again, so step by step in, in my to-do list and um, uh, on my YouTube channel, I have a preparation for the workflow. I have some videos how to um, install the CLI on the JFrog YouTube channel, you will find a bunch of uh, stuff as well. So it's good to, to um, subscribe to this channel as well. So um, yeah, so that, that's more or less uh, for the workshop. I hope you learned a few new things. Um, last time to ask some questions. Any questions? No. Okay. So I will stop sharing my screen. Okay. So, okay. So I'm done on you. Okay. Then, if you have any questions, feel free to come to me later. Share uh, if you liked it. Share this information and uh, make sure that your colleagues are coming to my next workshop. I have a few in pipeline for the next few months. And uh, I have a bunch of free webinars as well. So you can see me outdoors somewhere in the woods explaining some basics about cybersecurity. So, okay, I'm done. Thanks so much, everyone. We appreciate it. And thank you, Sven.